This Week in Gaming. A major update came to Civilization VI. Crytek has shut down five studios. The Steam Winter Sale kicked off on December 22nd. Nintendo has shut down another fan project. Valve has been fined $3 million in Australia over their former lack of refunds. Steam now accepts Indian payment methods through NovaPlay. Utada Hikaru will be doing the Kingdom Hearts 3 theme song. Asheron's Paul is finally shutting down and a new SteamWorld game is in the works. This is 1RBC Gaming Weekly. To start with, Crytek has shut down their studios in Hungary, Turkey, Bulgaria, China, and South Korea. Crytek co-founder Avni Yerli made the following statement regarding the shutdown. Undergoing such transitions is far from easy, and we'd like to sincerely thank each and every staff member, past and present, for their hard work and commitment to Crytek. These changes are part of the essential steps we're taking to ensure Crytek is a healthy and sustainable business moving forward that can continue to attract and nurture our industry's top talent. The reasons for this have been communicated internally along the way. Our focus now lies entirely on the core strengths that have always defined Crytek. World-class developers, state-of-the-art technology, and innovative game development. And we believe that going through this challenging process will make us a more agile, viable, and attractive studio, primed for future success. This news is coming hot on the heels of rumors that Crytek hasn't been paying its employees after they've shifted their focus to VR games. Recently, they've launched The Climb, a rock climbing simulator, as well as Robinson the Journey, a sci-fi adventure about being stranded on a strange planet full of dinosaurs. Both games got pretty good critical reception and good reception from players as well, but haven't exactly set the sales charts ablaze, in large part due to the fact that relatively few people actually own VR headsets. According to a press release, the company now has plans to refocus on its core strengths of developing innovative games and game development technology. That is to say, focus on selling their CryEngine and presumably make more games with wider appeal. Hopefully this doesn't deter more studios from making VR games. It's a hard market to succeed in, but hopefully it leads to more devs to consider seriously the costs and risks involved in jumping into an emerging market. Our hearts go out to the developers affected by these shutdowns. In other game business news, Valve has been fined $3 million in Australia for violating Australia's laws on refunds. This case has run on for quite some time. It all started in 2014. Back then, Valve was not offering refunds on games. This is illegal in Australia. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission sued Valve and won. This week, Justice James Edelman has fined Valve 3 million Australian macaroonies, at least I think that's what they call their unit's currency down there. After the court case was initially filed, Valve has introduced a program for refunds, but because they'd already broken the law in Australia, they're still going to have to pay that penalty. Moral of the story? Never do business in Australia without a money-back guarantee, and never wage a land war in Russia in the winter. This hasn't been the greatest week for Valve. On Friday, the Steam store went offline temporarily due to a DDoS that lasted for a few hours. Steam went back up at around 2 p.m. On January 31st, 2017, long-running MMORPGs Asheron's Call and Asheron's Call 2 will be shut down. The first game was released on November 2nd, 1999. Developed by Turbine Entertainment and published by Microsoft, it was the third MMORPG to find major commercial success. After Ultima Online and EverQuest, that is. Turbine bought the rights to the franchise in 2004. Six years later, Warner Bros. Interactive Entertainment acquired Turbine. In 2014, Asheron's Call went free-to-play, albeit in maintenance mode meaning that there wouldn't be any more big updates or content. There were plans to allow player-run servers to be established, but it seems that those plans have since fallen through, resulting in quite a few disappointed players on the forums. It appears that there may be some changes happening at Warner Bros. Interactive as two of their other MMO properties, 
Lord of the Rings Online and DDO have since been acquired by Standing Stone Games. Lotro and DDO were previously worked on by Turbine, so it would appear that Asheron's Call was lost in the shuffle. Pokemon Prism was a fan-made Pokemon game eight years in development. It was set to be released on December 25th, 2016. This week, the project was shut down by Nintendo, who sent out a friendly but stern cease and desist to the game's developer, who was also responsible for developing the fan game Pokemon Brown. Nintendo has demanded that Brown be taken down and made unavailable to download, and that Prism not be released ever. It is disappointing that Nintendo has taken such an aggressive approach to protecting its IP from its players instead of embracing fan creations. To be clear, Nintendo is well within its rights to shut down fan projects that infringe on their copyright, but they don't necessarily need to. Case in point, the Sonic the Hedgehog IP is alive and kicking, not in spite of fan games, but in large part because of it. During E3 this year, Sega caused quite a stir when it was revealed that the upcoming Sonic Mania was being worked on by people who had made Sonic fan games, thus reinforcing confidence in their popular but notably troubled brand. Nintendo, on the other hand, has upset many people many times by shutting down long-awaited fan projects shortly before their launch. What do you think? Is Nintendo's approach to fan works the right one? Do they strengthen their brand by enforcing their exclusive rights to their IP, or do they lose goodwill among fans and ultimately hurt their brand? Hit us up on Twitter at OneRuleBeCool and share your thoughts. In Pokemon Go news this week, the game has been released on the Apple Watch. Well, sort of. The Apple Watch version of the game will log how far you walk and give notifications about hatching eggs and nearby Pokestops. You cannot, however, use the Apple Watch version of the game to actually catch Pokemon. This is definitely a step in the right direction, however. Pun intended and hopefully appreciated, since it'll help you save battery life as you'd ordinarily have to keep the energy sapping application open on your phone in order to log distance walked and hatch Pokemon eggs. The Winter 2016 update came to Sid Meier's Civilization VI this week, and it brought some pretty important balance changes regarding production costs and the space victory, along with bug fixes and improvements to the game's AI, and some other general quality of life improvements. It also brought some fresh content into the game. There's now a standard-sized Earth map. Further, some fresh DLC is available to purchase. Poland, as led by Jadwiga, is now playable. Historically, Jadwiga was the first female monarch of Poland, having ruled from 1384 until her death in 1399. She was crowned King of Poland, not Queen, most likely due to opposition to her betrothal to William, Duke of Austria. During her regrettably brief life, she became famed for her skill as a mediator, using diplomacy to maintain peace. In Civilization VI, playing as Jadwiga offers bonuses for spreading religion and acquiring territory. Thus far, the reaction to this DLC from users has been mixed. On the one hand, yay, a new civilization. On the other hand, it's five dollars for a single sieve. It's not multiple sieves in a pack, as was the case for Civilization V. Users have been leaving negative reviews on Steam because they dislike the business model and think it's a ripoff to sell individual civilizations piecemeal. That's not all the DLC out for Civ 6 this week, however, as the Viking Scenario Pack was also released. It brings a 100-turn scenario in which you live out your Viking dreams, invading England, seeking Vinland, or raiding along the Mediterranean. Sid Meier Civilization 6 is available on Steam for Windows. What do you think about the Polish situation? Do you think that it's greedy of Varaxis to sell civilizations individually? Or do you think that it represents a more effective long-term strategy? Hit us up on Twitter at OneRuleBeCool and let us know. In game releases this week, Roller Coaster Tycoon Classic was released on Android and iOS. The game costs $6 and combines content from both Roller Coaster Tycoon 1 and 2. Thus far, this mobile version of the game has accrued positive reviews from players. Plenty of folks are surprised by how well the game works on mobile devices. 
it's certainly been getting a much better response than Roller Coaster Tycoon World, which was released on Steam this year and has largely garnered a negative response from players, who are disappointed by the game's numerous glitches, ugly visuals, lack of personality, and overall weak presentation. Since the year is ending, right now is a great time to talk about some of the games that I've enjoyed throughout 2016. The first is SteamWorld Heist. I got to play this incredibly clever strategy game on the Nintendo 3DS, and it really grew on me. The game's premise is relatively simple. You're a steampunk robot in a galaxy full of other bots, and you're captain of a spaceship. Robotic space pirates prowl the solar system. As Captain Piper, you can board their ships and take back what they've stolen from their fellow robots. The gameplay of SteamWorld Heist is pretty unusual. It's a turn-based strategy game along the lines of XCOM. You move your units around and try to keep them alive and fighting. Unlike most other strategy games in the genre, however, it's set on a 2D plane. Think Mario instead of Fire Emblem. And you control weapons directly, so you have to carefully aim your lasers the old-fashioned way. It makes bouncy trick shots particularly satisfying. Besides having unique gameplay and an interesting world, the game's art really stands out. It's one of the best looking 3DS games out there. It's also available on the PlayStation Vita, PlayStation 4, Wii U, Mac, Windows, and Linux. With Once upon a time, there was a hero. Like every hero, he enjoyed strolling in majestic landscapes. The next game I'm recommending is Stories, The Path of Destinies. Developed by Spearhead Games, Stories, The Path of Destinies is a 3D platformer with a very clever premise. You have to lose over and over in order to win. Alright, to be a little more specific, in Stories, you play as a fox living in a fantasy kingdom, with the ability to travel back through time. The kingdom is in danger from a great evil, and it's up to you to stop it. You'll go through many different story paths, each time learning something new about the game's world and characters based on decisions you make in between levels of platform. Each time you go through the game, you're brought another step closer to saving the world. It's a lot like a choose-your-own-adventure book, except each path is really well fleshed out. My one complaint about the game is that playing through the same levels can get a touch repetitive, but fortunately the game's not too long, and it's kept fresh with a funny narrator and a rather exciting story. It is well worth checking out, and it's available on Windows and the PlayStation 4. First time you destroyed the world. Many destinies. One path, live. Another game I played in 2016 was The Banner Saga 2. The second game in the critically acclaimed strategy RPG series, The Banner Saga, The Banner Saga 2 picks up shortly after the events of the first game. The premise of which, in case you're unfamiliar with it, is that a world inspired by Norse mythology seems to be coming to an end. Stone giants roam the earth, and the sun never sets. It's up to you to lead a group of survivors to safety somehow, trying to keep your party alive by defending them from the aforementioned giants and other threats. The turn-based strategy gameplay is a bit like that of XCOM. The Banner Saga truly shines in its story, which is pretty gripping, and often calls upon players to make wrenching decisions with real consequences. Something I really like about the Banner Saga series in general is that some of the decisions that you make don't have consequences. A good chunk of the decisions that you make in conversation with other characters is dialogue-oriented. It enhances the role-playing experience by putting you in the shoes of the leader you're playing as. You get to make a decision about what they say, so while their words and such, they fit the story and personality of the character, you also get to put in a bit of your own character, if that makes sense. The Banner Saga 2 is available on Windows, Mac, the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Android, and iOS. Survival games aren't usually my thing, but I have to make an exception for The Flame and the Flood. Set in what's referred to as a post sidal America, The Flame and the Flood is a survival game with roguelike elements in which you play as a survivor of a calamity that flooded the US. You ride your raft along a raging river with your trusty dog by your side. You've gotta watch out for wolves, boars, poisonous snakes, and the occasional bear, 
all while trying to stay healthy, rested, and fed. What made the game stand out to me was its overall style and attitude. It didn't feel desperate in the way that some survival games do. It has a really laid-back vibe, so while there is constant pressure to keep finding food, and water, and shelter, and that's what really keeps driving the game forward, there's also something very mellow about the whole experience. The Flame in the Flood is a survival game that you can relax with. The Flame in the Flood is available on Mac, Windows, Linux, and the Xbox One. The PlayStation 4 version of the game is set to be released in 2017. The last game of 2016 that I'm recommending is Halcyon 6 Starbase Commander, a sci-fi strategy RPG that, quite creatively, combines elements of FTL, Faster Than Light, the base building of XCOM, and JRPGs. In Halcyon 6, you've been put in charge of a space station after your superiors have seemingly been destroyed by an advanced alien race. You have to balance your resources and officers carefully between exploring the galaxy, collecting new resources, defending your space station from space pirates, and preparing to beat back the strange, powerful aliens who have mysteriously appeared. You also have to conduct diplomacy with some of the other aliens around the galaxy, taking on quests and dealing with interspecies conflicts. Further, as you expand your space station to include new rooms for research and shipbuilding, you have to assign officers to be ready to fight off aliens as it seems that the space station was at some point an intergalactic zoo. This is where the Final Fantasy style gameplay takes place, with turn-based gameplay. Different classes of officers play a bit differently. Some take a more defensive style, others more offensive. The differences between officer classes and abilities also applies to the ships, which have similar turn-based combat. Overall, it's a well-designed game with a surprisingly great sense of humor, and interesting world building alongside nicely varied gameplay. Halcyon 6 Starbase Commander is currently available on Steam for Mac, Windows, and Linux. This week, a new Japanese trailer was released for the upcoming Dragon Quest IX. This latest RPG in the long-running series is currently in development for the Nintendo 3DS and PlayStation 4. This week, we also received word that Dragon Quest IX is in development for the Nintendo Switch. It's set to be released in Japan sometime in 2017. No word yet on a Western release. Speaking as a fan of the SteamWorld franchise, I got a pretty great email this week. A new game in the SteamWorld franchise is being developed. I really enjoyed the last couple of games in the series. SteamWorld Dig, which came out a few years ago, is a Metroidvania platformer in which you are a steampunk robot, doing plenty of digging and mining for resources while uncovering an awesome secret. SteamWorld Heist, the latest game, is a sort of strategy game in which you're a space pirate slash privateer. It plays like XCOM crossed with worms, and it's well worth checking out. Now, this next game, SteamWorld Project 2017, was announced this week. Image and Form hasn't said anything about how the game actually plays, but it will be available to play at PAX East 2017. Stick with us, as we'll be keeping a close eye out for whatever this game turns out to be. Finally, we have the latest trailer for the upcoming Everborn, a beautiful 3D platformer that's set to be released in 2017 for PC and consoles.
Well, that's it for this week's game news. For all the greatest game news and editorials, be sure to follow at One Will Be Cool on Twitter and Instagram. Follow me at Jordan underscore Cameron for my own views. Just a quick heads up, there won't be an episode of One RBC Gaming Weekly next week, since not much tends to happen in the world of gaming at the very end of the year. The show will return on January 7th, 2017.